Hello and welcome to Not Take Tuesday, Take Thursday. I hope you're all very well. Uh, this is the new home of our tech session. So we're going to be Tech Thursdays from now moving forward. And this is the new time as well. So if you're in the UK, 7 p.m. Uh, if you're in the uh, east of, uh, of USA, I think it's 2, p uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon or perhaps 1 p.m. in the afternoon. But hopefully it is a better time for everybody to be joining us here Um at I'm Digital Solutions. And if you don't know me, my name is David and I'm your Tech Thursday host uh, moving forward. And I'm here to answer any of your questions. So make sure you pop them all in the comments as well. But every Tech Thursday does have a little theme to it. And the theme to this Tech Thursday is the wonderful EM5 Mark III. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. I'll put it up here so it focuses next to my face. Uh, and we're going to go over a few slides just to show you what the differences between the EM5 Mark III and the EM5 Mark II were as it progressed through the generations. And I'll also put it up next to an EM1 Mark II so you can kind of see how it weighs up in there as well. Now, like I said, all of your questions and comments are welcome today on Tech Thursday, and I'll try to do my best to answer as many of them as possible. I do have a couple of other cameras here, so I can, I'm handy with my little cable, so I can plug in ready with one of the other cameras if you need something demonstrating, so I'll do that. Uh, and just say hi, give us a wave, make sure uh, that, that uh, I know where you're from. Of course, if there's any problems, because I'm here on my own, let me know that there's audio problems in here. Uh, and if enough of you say there's an audio problem, then there's something that I need to fix on this side. So already lots of you popped in to say hello before the live stream started. This live stream is recorded, by the way. So if you can't watch the whole thing or if you're, uh, you're just dipping in and out, then go back to the OM uh, System YouTube channel later on and you'll be able to watch it back and find out what you missed. Let's say a few quick hellos before we dive into looking at the EM5 Mark III, as we always do. Uh, we've got straight in there, before we started, we had Tiago and Larry saying hi, um, Roy in Cornwall. Uh, Linda already had a question, which I'll look at in a second as well. And then you've got Paul, uh, you've got Sri from Toronto, Noel from Scotland, lots of you uh, popping in and saying hi. And I'm really sorry if I don't get to say hi to everybody because I could genuinely spend the next hour saying hello uh, to all of you, finding out where you're from. But we are here to talk technical. So make sure you get your technical questions into the comments and I'll do my best to pick out ones that I think I can deal with right now. And again, my apologies if I don't get through all of them, uh, I will do my best, but you can also reach out to us uh, at OM Digital Solutions, uh, your local support regionally uh, or here in the comments as well. We'll try and answer all of them after the live feed for you too. So I wanted to just challenge uh, Linda's, uh, Linda Krugman to put a question in there. And the question is about setting focus peaking. So for those of you that don't know, focus peaking is an excellent manual focus assistant tool that will show you a visual colored edge around what's in focus. And primarily it's used for things like macro to show you where uh, the very fine depth of field and what's in focus in your frame and where that is. So Linda's asked, when setting focus peaking, she's got it set in the menu, but it doesn't show in the EVF or the LCD when manually focusing. So there's a couple of things that are really, really important to remember when using focus peaking. And the first one is that it relies mostly on contrast to be able to show you the edges of the subject that's in focus. Now, that means that you need to have enough light on your subject for that contrast to be detectable by the camera. So if you're shooting very low light conditions with focus peaking switched on, you may see very little, if any, uh, focus peaking at all. Now, what I tend to do as a result of things like that is I always carry a little torch with me when I'm shooting macro objects just to shine some extra light on uh, and I can hold the small torch in my shooting hand pointing forward. That adds enough light for me, for me to be able to do the focus peaking. Now, that's only one option, and you do need to make sure that you either want the torch light in there or you don't for the exposure. So that can be a little bit tricky, uh, but ultimately, that's one way of doing it. The other way to do it is to enhance the level of focus peaking that you have available. And the quick way to do that is to press the info button whilst turning the focus ring. And if focus peaking is switched on, pressing the info button will bring up three little options at the bottom of your screen. Uh, one is for the focus peaking color, where you can choose between black, white, white, yellow, or red. Uh, one is for the intensity, so you might want to turn the intensity up to the, the highest intensity so you can see more of it. And the other one is for an image brightness adjust option, which might be what you're looking for, Linda. So if you switch the image brightness adjust on, 
when you use the manual focus ring on your lens, not only will focus peaking activate, but the, the image will also um, brighten uh, more than what you've got in reality. So you can see a little bit more as well. So hopefully that's answered that for you relatively well. Um, I'm going to hold all my comments where I am now. So I'm going to go back to a couple that have come in earlier. Just have a quick skim. Remember, I'm on my own. So I'm going through all my comments uh, as they come in. And I also have to press buttons that do things like this and ask you to put comments in the bottom and, uh, and saying thank you for joining us all today. So this is all me. If you hear button clickings, I'm here on my own doing this. I think what we'll do is we're going to start the EM5 uh, comparison. We're going to take a little look at it and see exactly where um, where we are with EM5 Mark III. So let me see if I can be very, very smart and bring this in here. So this is your introduction to EM5 Mark III. If you're not familiar with it, is it the mid-range in terms of the OMDs as we have an OM, uh, sorry, OM, we don't, we have an EM10, uh, which is our entry level uh, or beginner range. And then we have our EM5, which is our mid to semi-pro. And then we have the EM1 series, which is the pro. And then of course, we've now stepped over to OM system products to the OM1, which is our pro flagship camera. So the EM5 is kind of there in the middle for us and it is a weather sealed camera, which is fantastic. Let's have a little introduction and see what it's all about. So we've just got a comparison here for you. This is the EM5 Mark III on the left, EM5 Mark II on the right, just showing you that we've decreased massively the weight between the two cameras. And a lot of that has been achieved by changing the body material slightly and utilizing a smaller battery. Uh, despite using a smaller battery, we still get fantastic power uh, capabilities out of it. And we'll come across to that in just a second. So we're dropping down. 12% of the weight, which is absolutely amazing if you want to go with a travel camera or a street camera that needs to be nice and light. Now that battery has changed. We've made it smaller. So we've gone down to the BLS 50 battery, which is very similar to the BLS 5 battery from previous models of camera. But this one's actually got better power capabilities. So you've got up to 310 shots, which is the same as the previous one, but it is in a smaller unit. Um, up to 110 minutes of movie shooting time. And most of all, really, really importantly on this one is that it's now a USB charging battery in camera. So really, really um, important to kind of move forward with USB uh, in-camera charging options. Now, if we compare things like the AF system, we're going to be looking straight away at how many AF points or autofocusing points the EM5 Mark III has over the EM5 Mark II. So the the Mark II was 81 contrast only AF points. And this is what was a big separator between people choosing to go with an EM5, which was 81 points contrast, up to an EM1, which at that time would have been to 121 points of phase and contrast. But now we've pushed that 121 points of AF uh, contrast and phase into the EM5 Mark III. So if you wanted that really fast moving stuff that the phase detector was really, really good at for the EM1 series, you've now got that capabilities in the 5 Mark III as well. Super fast uh, and lots of AF points covering almost the whole frame. Now, as we go through, I'm going to dip in and out of these slides just to give you a break from talking about EM5 and to come over and balance the number of questions and comments that we get over here in the comment section. So I'm going to have a quick look back into there to see exactly what's going on. There are loads of you watching. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate that. It's great when you see over 300 people watching because it means that I'm not talking to, uh, to, to myself, <laughs> which is most of what I do during the day. Uh, so let's have a look. Roy Jenkins Packer. Hello, Roy. Good to see you in here. Uh, I, I know you. Um, Roy's asked, please, can you tell me the difference uh, between photo stacking and photo bracketing? So I think Roy means focus stacking and focus bracketing uh, for use in mac macro. And that's using the EM5 Mark III as well. So the main difference between focus stacking and focus bracketing is that focus stacking gives you a final result in camera of many images uh, at different focal points compressed together to give you more depth of field. Whereas focus bracketing, you can take many more images, but the camera doesn't do anything with them. And you'll need to use your uh, preferred editing software in order to stack those. And you could use OM Workspace, you can use Lightroom, uh, Photoshop. My preference is for a software called Helicon Focus, and that's a dedicated focus stacking software. And that'll take all the images that you've bracketed 
in the camera and, and stack them together for you. Whereas focus stacking will take a minimal number of images. And on the EM5 Mark III, it's going to take eight, uh, an allotted amount of eight. You can't change that. Um, and it's going to push them together and create a final um, stacked JPEG for you. So hopefully that answers your question there. Let's bring that screen back down while I look in for another question as well. Uh, greetings to people like uh, Noel in Scotland, uh, Marsha, who's just received an OM1, fantastic news, um, David in Milton Keynes in the UK, uh, we've got Marty from Indy, and Christian from a hot and humid southern Louisiana. We start, I think you may have sent some of that over here actually to the UK, it's been absolutely stifling today. Uh, so that's why my glasses keep slipping down. <laughs> so if you see me doing this a lot, uh, I apologize. Okay, let's do a quick uh, skim through and see if there is a good question. And if not, I'll jump back onto the EM5. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, fantastic. I've got a really good question here that we're going to bring up. Uh, so let me show this one. So this one is from Photomaker. Photomaker is saying, what is the best way to do tethering using the EM5 Mark III? And this is a really good question um, because the EM5 Mark II was capable of wired tethering uh, to a laptop, Mac, computer, whatever, um, and using the OM Capture software to do studio tethering. Now, the EM5 Mark III is not capable of doing that. So the best way to operate the camera or have a, a, a screen uh, would be by using the OI Share app. Um, it's not tethering uh, precisely because it's not using the OM capture software, uh, but it's just not possible to do that with the EM5 Mark III. So I recommend using the OI Share app there, Photomaker. Um, okay, and then we've also got, let's see if I can find another question in here. Uh, Kyle's asked, indeed, relating to the last question, please bring that back tethering in the next update, please. Well. Hopefully the big bosses do see this. So we'll see what happens from there. Uh, okay, let's head back into the uh, EM5 comparison. We'll come back into the questions from there as well. So we'll leave the AF system uh, screen and we'll move over to uh, talking about how many points there are and ultimately it's performance in low light. So if you think about EM5 Mark III, then you had four target options. You had the single point, uh, a nine point grid, um, a, a small grid and all 81 points active. Now in the EM5 Mark III, you've got uh, six. So you've got the single point, a five point cross, uh, a nine, a 25 and all 121 points plus the small precise point as well, which we saw on the EM1. Uh, you can adjust the AF sensitivity through the CAF menu. You've got a center start and center priority options like you do in the EM1, which enables the AF to run a full cycle of, of, uh, of focusing systems in the central point before moving across and outwards to other points within a specific chosen grid. And the AF low light performance has been improved as well. So you've got focusing down to minus three EV on the EM5 Mark III. Image stabilization, of course, is something that we've done fantastically well and moved over and improved even more so into the OM1. Uh, the EM5 Mark III is a great improvement um, over the EM5 Mark II in terms of stabilization. Previously, five or six stops, depending on whether or not you were using a Sync IS lens, they're now up to five and a half and six and a half stops with Sync IS lenses. Now, Sync IS lenses are things like the 12 to 100 Pro lens, the 300 millimeter Pro lens, of course, the 150 to 400 pro lens as well. So superb uh, image stabilization from that unit in there. Uh, and a great improvement on the viewfinder as well. So we haven't moved the resolution from 2.36 million pixels, but we've created an OLED viewfinder, which is much smoother, much more comfortable. Uh, and of course, allows you to wear polarized sunglasses if you do and still be able to see that viewfinder. So the panel technology has changed slightly. And we've also placed uh, an eye point at 27 millimeters. Now that might just seem like a random feature that we've added in and have no real cause for, uh, for, um, for cheer. But if like me, you're a glasses wearer, spectacles, eyeglasses, uh, depending on where you're from, then 27 millimeters eye point makes it very comfortable to see the whole viewfinder inside as you use that camera. So really good for people who wear specs. 
And then obviously we've improved uh, some of the base shooting functions that we've had in most of our cameras over the years. So previously on the EM5 Mark II, you had live bulb, lifetime, live composite, which are the fantastic long exposure modes. I'm sure we'll be doing loads of content on those modes in the next few coming months, particularly as we go towards the darker nights. You've got the focus bracketing and focus stacking built-in features as well, and the tripod-based high-res shot at 40 million pixels. Now, because the sensor has increased from 16 million pixels to 20 million pixels, we're now able to do tripod-based high-res at 50 million pixel equivalent, that's in RAW or JPEG. And you've got the addition of in-camera fisheye compensation. So if you're using the eight millimeter F1.8 fisheye, you can defish in camera to create a JPEG image for you. Um, and of course, one of the most superb things that were added to the EM5 Mark III is the Pro Capture feature. And for those of you that aren't aware, it's fantastic for sports or wildlife situations where you don't know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And Pro Capture is basically a little time machine inside your camera that buffers up images before you fully press the shutter. So that's been added in there as well, which is a fantastic addition. You've now also got direct access to those long exposure modes by B mode on the top dial. Uh, this is one that definitely got me when the camera first came out as I was heading into the manual mode to try and find live composite. And of course, it wasn't there because it's all transferred into the B mode on the dial. And the movie options have also improved as well. EM5 Mark II had some reasonable movie options with full HD, uh, the flat mode, the mic jack, and the headphone jack on the optional grip as well. Uh, we've now added into the EM5 Mark II Cinema 4K at 24p, 4K at 30p, 25 and 24, uh, and full HD, a variety of options, including 120p, which is going to give you your slow motion as well. You get a flat mode in there, mic jack, and improved AF performance in video mode uh, too. So, coming over to the user interface, things have changed ever so slightly. We've removed the flash sync port on the front, which is an interesting uh, one, really, because as much as I use a huge amount of Studio Flash, um, I haven't used the Studio Flash sync port for many, many years. So that's gone, and that's part of the keeping the weight down. So we've kept uh, the weight down, removing parts of that. It is using the same iCup as the EM5 Mark II. So if you've got any spare iCups lying around and you're doing an upgrade, then you can keep hold of those as well. We've put in a slightly larger, more comfortable grip, a dedicated ISO button on the shoulder, on the right shoulder of the camera, uh, and the toggle switching uh, between the, uh, the AF modes is available on switches one to two. And what that does is in previous iterations, the toggle switching would move you uh, from utilizing your dials in say, let's, I don't know, let's say shutter speed, an aperture uh, to making those dials respond to ISO and white balance. And now by default, switching that lever to one, two will switch you from one AF mode to another. So for example, single autofocus or to continual autofocus. So really, really useful. And you can also repurpose uh, that lever to be your power on and off switch as well, which is superb. Uh, okay, let's, um, let's drop the slide down. Let's come back in. Um, to the questions. We've got another one here from Photo Maker coming through, uh, asking, how can I get the best timing for when I uh, went to start a pro capture run of images? Well, that's uh, that's a golden question. That is a golden question. When it comes to using pro capture, the images are buffered uh, when you halfway press. So let me bring my camera up here. So when I uh, halfway press this front button, we'll then get the pro capture icon of two arrows buffering on the screen. Uh, and all that is is simply then a matter of waiting for the action to happen. Now, if you input, uh, it's a maximum of 14 images before the, the shutter press on EM5. So if you input the maximum of 14 images, all you've got to do is halfway press that shutter whilst focusing on the subject that's going to do something. Um, and then when you, you physically see it do it, fully press that shutter because as much as you'll be at a split second late, the camera will have captured them anyway. So it should be nice and easy to get a good run on Pro Capture. Um, okay, so let's go through and find another question for you. Um, Phil has asked, the M5 Mark III doesn't have focus peaking question mark. It does have focus peaking. Yeah, there is focus peaking available in the EM5 Mark III and that is available either from the uh, AF menu um, where you can set it on. And then in the display menu, the D menu, you can set the colors and things like that. So it is available. Um, 
let's see, Corey went searching for live comp on the 4th of July and couldn't find it on the EM5 Mark II. Well, that's a great uh, question to find out where it is, Corey. Uh, on the EM5 Mark II, live composite, live bulb and bulb mode are at the back end of the longest shutter speed in manual. So you'll switch to M on the dial and then you'll use your rear dial to take that shutter speed all the way down to 60 seconds. And then the next click will give you bulb. Another one will give you live uh, live time. And then a final one will give you live composite. And that's all in the manual mode. And that's what uh, sort of got me when the EM5 Mark III came out because uh, that's what I was doing to get to live composite. But now there is a dedicated B mode on the top dial uh, for us to find live composite in. Uh, Dan, what does P mean? <laughs> this is a great question, Dan. What does P mean? Well, many people will have different opinions on what P means. Uh, <laughs> I think some will use the tongue in cheek to say that P means professional. Uh, well, what it actually stands for is program. Uh, and it's basically allowing the camera to choose absolutely anything. And the user is simply inputting how bright or dark they want the image. But it does stand for program. Um, not professional as we jest sometimes in in the uh, in the industry. Okay, let's go back to my EM5 slides just in here. So we looked at those uh, those added user interfaces here. If you look on the top of the camera, we've obviously got that dedicated button to switch drive mode. So that's whether you want a single shot, a sequential burst, a custom timer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You've got the panels on the side that are the weather seal panels where you've got a remote jack input uh, which is compatible with rmcv2 uh, it would also be compatible with the rmwr1 the new bluetooth remote but in its wired form because it does come with a wire as well uh, you've got the mode switch on the top uh, you've also got a locking mechanism uh, so it's a click in click off mechanism to lock the mode dial uh, and you have one c mode on the dial so a customizable mode on the top dial rather than photo story which was there previously in the em5 mark ii now, both of those cameras had the current generation of our supersonic wave filter. And I think I've talked about supersonic wave filters huge amounts on, on this show uh, in the past when it was Tech Tuesdays and in other content that we've created. And, and I love the supersonic wave filter. It's a fantastic piece of technology uh, that vibrates 30,000 times per second when you switch your camera on and off. And sometimes you can just hear a little sound as you do it uh, and that's that supersonic wave filter chucking all the dust off at 30,000 times per second um, accelerating loads of g-force as well at a time over a tiny surface area so the em5 mark ii had the best one in its iteration and the em5 mark ii has an even better one now that has the same coating on the sensor that we put into the em1x so that reduces that uh, possibility of dust sticking to the surface even more Your connectivity in there both had Wi-Fi. Uh, the EM5 Mark III now benefits from combination Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and it also has the automatic JPEG or JPEG and RAW transfer as well, whereas the previous model with JPEG transfer only. Uh, so with the Bluetooth support, you've got much more fu uh, functionality. The automatic image transfer is fantastic, so it basically means that you can transfer images when the camera's in your bag, and the Bluetooth will automatically turn the camera on ready for import. USB charging not available in the EM5 Mark II, uh, but it is available via the EM5 Mark III, and this is by using a micro USB. Uh, so standard micro USB that you would uh, you get in the pack uh, or that you would use for a micro USB powered phone as well, for a cell phone, um, or you can use the USB-C AC adapter that it comes with as well. And there is much improvement in the noise area for EM5 Mark III over EM5 Mark II. So previous native range would go up to ISO 1600. Uh, the native range for the EM5 Mark III is uh, 6400. So that's a two-stop improvement. And what we're seeing at 6400 is what we would have seen at 1600 in terms of performance on the EM5 Mark II. So that's a really nice improvement over that. Uh, We'll look at this slide real quickly because this is a comparison uh, to the EM1 Mark II. So moving that comparison away from the EM5 series and looking at it towards an EM5, uh, an EM1 Mark II, obviously the weight difference here is quite dramatic. It's 27% lighter 
than an EM1 Mark II. Uh, you don't have that full grip system and the body material is very different between the EM5 Mark III and the EM1 Mark II as well. Uh, but internally, you're gaining nearly the same performance from these two machines. So it's great to have this option of whether or not you use the EM5 Mark II with its bigger, bulkier body uh, or with the EM5 Mark III, which is a much more run and gun style body in there as well. Um, if we look at the image stabilization, they're matching. So we've got five and a half stops of stabilization in body in both of these. And that's because of the difference of the release uh, dates and the technology available at the time. So again, you're matching that, uh, that performance from an EM1 Mark II with this five Mark III. And again, it's got that better OLED viewfinder in there. So the panel uh, technology is much better in the EM5 Mark III as well. But there is no difference in the resolution. They're both still 2.6 million pixels in there. You do get a slightly greater magnification in the EM1 Mark II, but they're both 100% field of view. Uh, but again, the eye point for if you wear glasses is much better in the EM5 Mark III as well. So when it comes to high speed performance, obviously the EM1 range is always going to be quicker uh, and it's going to be a challenge to decide whether or not you need those speeds or whether an EM5 Mark III is going to provide you with the performance that you want. If we look at performance in terms of continual autofocus, the 5 Mark III is going to give you 10 frames per second in continual autofocus versus the 18 on the EM1 Mark II. Uh, 30 frames per second in, in single autofocus or first frame fixed lock. Uh, whereas you would get the 60 frames per second on the EM1 Mark II. And then, of course, the pro capture differences are you can use its, their, uh, their relative speeds for each body. But with the EM1 Mark II, you get up to 35 shots before that, before that full press buffer. And you only get 14 within the EM5 Mark III. One SD card slot on an EM5, two SD card slots on an EM1, and the buffer size is obviously much, much different. So 150 raw images buffering in the EM5 Mark III uh, and up to 321 in an EM1 Mark II. So weighing up those differences versus the kind of uh, pros and cons of weight, size, things like that, that's going to be a very personal thing if you're looking to upgrade in that sort of area. And the EM5 Mark III is actually uh, in promotion uh, pretty much all over the world at the moment. So it's really worth going and looking at your sales outlet to see what the EM5 Mark III promotions are. I know that they're slightly different depending on where you are in the world, but there's some really, really good offers if that's where you are looking to upgrade at the moment. Uh, okay, let's bring this back out and let's look at some more uh, questions. So forgive me if I look like I'm scanning through questions. It's because quite rightly so you... Uh, you all have nice conversations in there between yourselves. And that's the best thing about our community. So I have to try and run through the bits where you're not talking to me. Um, and Ruben's put up a very good uh, question, which I'm going to answer anyway. Uh, Ruben asked, does it have a plastic chassis? So it has a polycarbonate chassis. Uh, so I wouldn't say plastic because plastic doesn't quite have the quality, but the polycarbonate has the durability that the EM5 needs rather than that metal body. And that's reduced some of the weight as well. Uh, it's also mixed components in there as well. So there will be some metal pieces but predominantly polycarbonate uh, and carbon body. Uh, let's have a little look. Lots of people talking about rumors. <laughs> rumors will be what they will be, uh, sadly. Um, I heard a rumor that I was going to get my car that I ordered, uh, but that, sadly that was just a rumor. It's still months and months away from my new car. Uh, Maurice is putting a question saying, what's the best SIM card? I think with this, Maurice's question is relating to SD cards. Uh, and realistically, it, it kind of depends on what you want to shoot. If you're going to shoot fast moving things where you're going to need a, bit, uh, a really quick uh, write speed and good buffering, pro capture, things like that, uh, then we're going to recommend that you get the fastest uh, UHS for this model, for the EM5 Mark III, the fastest UHS-1 card that you can get. Um, but if you're using UHS-2 card slots like the EM-1 series or the OM-1 series, uh, then, then you're going to be using UHS-2, which is much, much faster. So get the right card for the model that you've got and check if it's UHS-2 compatible, get those ones for the speed. Um, fantastic stuff. So let's go back and have another look at our slides. Uh, <laughs> Photo Maker has asked me, I'm going to pop this one up here. Photo Maker has asked me, did I order a Tesla? I wish I could have ordered a Tesla. No, I have ordered a, um, a plug-in hybrid vehicle. I'm not going to mention any brand names because um, 
people might troll me and tell me that I'm an old man. Um, but I have ordered a hybrid, which is a, a, it's a, a nice, efficient and pretty eco-friendly car. <laughs> Thanks for asking, Photomaker. Um, okay, so let's go back in here and talk about uh, movie. So if we compare the movie standards, uh, there are some differences between EM5 Mark III and the EM1 Mark II, which is what we're comparing now. In your EM5 Mark III, you've got cinema 4K, 4K, full HD up to 120 frames per second. You get a flat mode and you get a mic jack. The EM1 Mark II gives you a little bit extra. So you get the same cinema 4K, 4K, full HD up to 120. Uh, you get flat mode and OM log 400 mode, which is an excellent log shooting format so that you can then color grade in post edit for your videos. You get a mic and headphone jack in the body. You get a view assistant and battery information in minutes. So it's a lot easier to gauge exactly how far you are away from the end of a battery. So there are some quite um, discernible differences between those two. But again, it's weighing up what you need in your own personal scenario. There's going to be a lot of you out there right now going, do you know what, David? I don't shoot movie. I don't care. That, that part of the camera is yeah, I'm not really that bothered about it. So then you can take all that out of the scenario. But then again, there are some of you out there that are really pushing forward with movies. So you'll want to weigh up exactly what you need from that. The connectivity uh, is very, very similar. But again, the EM5 Mark III does have the Bluetooth benefit over just the Wi-Fi alone. Uh, but you can, of course, use JPEG and RAW transfer for both of these. No USB charging in an EM1 Mark II, exactly. This is another part of the power efficiency that's been improved on the newer models. So your EM5 Mark III gets that USB in camera charging. And that kind of gives you your sort of breakdown of what the EM5 Mark III uh, can offer you. In terms of the way the camera works, it's got some amazing features. It's been brought very much closer in line with the EM1 series of cameras from the OMD range, and it is super, super light. EM5 series has always been one of my favorite cameras because of how super, super light they were. Uh, on my EM5 Mark II that I, uh, that I previously used myself, I used to have just the simple front grip on the front. Uh, rather than the front grip and the battery grip. And it just gave me enough of that nice light body to be able to go around and comfortably shoot. This one is paired with the lovely 17 millimeter F1.8 lens. And this is an adorable street combination as well. So if it's something that you're looking for in terms of a nice lightweight street combination, you've got that superb profile. Uh, it's really pocketable as well, which is the key to being out and about on the street. So, Let's have a quick look into the comments. Don't forget to stick your questions in there and I'll try and uh, answer as many of them as I can. Uh, let's see. Okay, so yeah, so uh, Sixtus has just put up any more differences between the M1 Mark II and the M5 Mark III connectivity? Yeah, so as I said, the M5 Mark III, EM5 Mark III has that Bluetooth capability as well, which the M1, uh, EM1 does not have. So that's a great um, add-on as well. Hi, Ron. Joined late, got to go back, catch the early point. No problem. This is the benefit. The whole thing's been recorded, so you can go back onto our channel and watch it at a later date, pick up on all the other things. And of course, you can keep adding comments into that section, just not in the live chat as well. Okay, somebody asked about Blinkies further up, and Linda is also uh, responding to that question as well. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to do this on an OMD. I'll do it on an EM1 Mark III, okay? So we'll bring up some Blinkies. Now, the easiest way to do this is to make sure that they are first turned on within your menu, uh, and then we're going to use the info button to toggle through what we actually see on the live view screen on the back or in the viewfinder, okay? So if I keep touching my nose, I'm so sorry, but I've got hay fever and it's really itchy today. So I know it's not a nice thing to do. I'll try to not touch my nose as much as possible. Okay, so let's go across and oh, let's do this so that you can still see me as well. Uh, we'll take Linda's question down just for a moment. And we're going to look for the highlight and shadow blinkies. Okay, so what this means is, first of all, we're going to hit the menu. This is on an OMD. Uh, and from the menu, we are going to go into the gear icon. And we're going to go across and scroll through our alphabet. Uh, and we're looking for D1, which is display. It's anything that you see. So D for display, into control setting, uh, sorry, into info settings, and press OK. And we're going to drop down to the LV info option. That stands for live view info. And press the right arrow key. Now, you'll get three options that are ticked, image only, custom one, and custom two. If they're ticked, it means when you're viewing your live view and you press info, it's toggling between whatever options we've selected in image only, 
custom one and custom two. So let's go and look in custom one and see what's what's ticked. We've got ah, we've got the histogram ticked in custom one. And then if I go back and check custom two, we've got the level gauge ticked in custom two. But in neither of those have we got the highlights and shadow, which is the blinkies, orange for over uh, for highlight burnout and, and blue for shadow. So what we'll do, the easiest way to do this, rather than having a histogram and, well, you can have it any way you like, really, but for my preference, rather than having a histogram and the blinkies, I'm going to have the histogram on custom one so that I can toggle through to custom two and have my highlight and shadow blinkies plus the level gate. So I'm just going to tick that with an OK checkbox, OK? So then let's go back to the live view. And obviously, we're not seeing them right now because we would, we're, we're going to see the shadows because I've got a lens cap on there and that should come up blue. So as I'm doing now, I'm going to press info once. And that takes me to image only. I'm going to press it again. And that takes me to uh, what well, it should be histogram. I'm going to press it one more time. And then that takes me to my level gauge and my blinky. So as you can see here, this is the shadow blinkies of course now if i were to take the lens cap off and point this up here um, at my um my studio light so you can see there that because of the settings in general uh it's seeing all the shadow around there but if i bring this back up to a reasonable there's our orange blinkies to say that's a huge source of light and that's massively overexposed and that's how you will bring up the blinkies now if you want to do the same thing on an om1 let's bring my face back up there. Let's swap over some cameras. So that was on an OMD, remember? We can do exactly the same thing on an OM1. Switch that one on and we will pop it up here. Oh, and then go back to that one. There we go. So menus are in a different place. The principle is exactly the same. So we're going to hit menu and we're going to go across to operations menu and we're going to go into uh, page, uh, sorry, the gear icon tab, page four, info settings, and press OK. And again, it's a similar concept, but you have a few more. So you have image only, information one. Now that's grayed out because that's the one the camera's currently using. Information two and information three. And that's there's three of these because there is more options within the OM1 to see. So if we go into information one, you'll see that that has the histogram. But I have all these extra options here to have in. So we've got information one that we're using now. We'll go into information two, press right, and I'll have highlight and shadow again. Let's go back to information three, tick it so that it does toggle when we go through with the info button. And then in there, we've got all battery information and silent touch operation, which is really good uh, things to have. So let's go back to our live view now. This is information one, the one that's being used. If I press info to toggle that through, you can see now there that kind of blue uh, kind of fuzziness. Let's go up here. There we go. Blue fuzziness. And then if I overexpose there, we've got the orange uh, blinkies as well. And if I pop this back on and then I toggle through again with info, you'll now see if you look over to the left hand side of the screen, oh, which is that way, actually, because I'm in reverse, you'll see that you get all battery info. Uh, so it's telling you that it's 100% battery, but it's also saying that there's no power battery grip attached. So therefore, there's no second battery uh, on there. And then if I wasn't connected to the HDMI, I would get silent touch operation as well. Uh, okay, so definitely for the person that asked uh, earlier, it was Bob Harris, and then further pushed on by Linda. I hope that that answers those questions for you. Uh, it's just a case of allowing them in your information and toggling through with the info button. Uh, okay, so let's have a quick look through at what else we've got. I have to find my comments again now uh, and find out who's not talking about Teslas in the comments um, now. Uh, so how does the, oh, excellent. This is a good question. So Bill, uh, Bill wants to know how does the Bluetooth wake up work? And basically what that does is, uh, all you have is the Bluetooth function on in the camera, uh, for Bluetooth standby. Uh, and that just puts the camera into Bluetooth standby so that it can wake up via a command from the app. And I think probably very soon we'll be due to do an OI share app, um, overview again. So something that we'll do. Uh, perhaps a live on or a content video on just to give you all a bit more information about how that works because as we've now progressed through more functionality comes out of the app so lots of things to touch on with that one um, 
Okay, so let's have a look. Francesca. Hi, Francesca Shearcroft. It's great to see you in here. Thank you for joining. Hopefully, I will see you in uh, Norwich over the next couple of days, which is where I'll be. Um, for anybody that wants to come and see me, uh, if you're in the UK and you're in the Norfolk area over the next two days, I will be at Wex Photo Video in Norwich for their anniversary. Come and say hi, have a chat. Uh, Francesca's asked if you can charge the battery of the EM5 Mark III with a power bank. Yes, you can. Uh, the only difference with the EM5 Mark III's USB charging is that you can't use the camera at the same time. So you'll have it switched off and connected to a power bank or a power supply and it will charge for you. Uh, let's see, Myra, can I set up a histogram on the super control panel? No, you can't set up a histogram from the super control panel, but you can access it by toggling with info as I just did with the highlights and blinkies. <laughs> I'll entertain this one, Dan. Simon says, touch your nose. And only because you said Simon says, I'm going to give it a little scratch because of my hay fever. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. I do love it when you lot look after me. That's fantastic. Uh, okay, so can we, this is a, oh, a great question as well in here, what we're looking at. We've got time yet. So Andrew Spencer has asked, can you set up a custom button to initiate focus bracketing? Yes, you absolutely can. It's a fantastic question. So let me do this again. I'll do this on an OMD. Uh, we'll do this on the EM1 Mark III. Uh, nice and simple. Oh, actually, we're not going to be able to do that on the EM1 Mark III unless my overhead camera is going to work. And if my overhead camera works, we may well be able to do this, actually. Fantastic. So uh, not as well prepared for the overhead stuff as I thought I would be. But let's see if we can set this up for Andrew, because, and the only reason why I need an overhead camera is because when we're looking at things like focus stacking, focus bracketing, my little cable doesn't work. So we can't stream that through the HDMI. So let's see if we can bring this in here. Ah, okay, brilliant stuff, right. Let's get some focus on here so that we can actually see the camera, fantastic stuff. And I'm just gonna uh, just darken this a little bit so you can all see. Now, obviously you can see there, that's the highlight and blinkies. Uh, blinkies that we put on earlier, so I'm just going to turn that off. So in terms of creating a custom button to initiate focus bracketing, first of all, you need to set the camera up in focus bracket mode. So we'll hit the menu key. We will go into, on an OMD, shooting menu number two. Across to bracketing, press OK, drop down to the on submenu and press right. Go all the way down to the focus BKT options. Now on an OMD, Focus BKT doubles as focus bracketing or focus stacking, depending on what is switched on at the time. So we're going to press right and we're going to go down to the on. It has a sub menu and press right again. As long as focus stacking is off, when we've set all this up, we'll go back to the previous menu and press on. That initiates focus bracketing. So let's say we want to set the number of shots not to 999 because we don't have NASA level computers, 299 shots at a focus differential of one, because if you're doing 299 shots, you definitely want a narrow focus differential. And I'll imagine that we're using an Olympus flash, so we don't need to set the charge time. So then we're gonna press menu to go back, press okay, so that on is next to focus BKT. Now, because we selected focus stacking off, it means that it will bracket, not stack. And then we're going to press menu again to go back and we're going to hit on for bracketing in general. Lots of ons, lots of OKs. A little half press on the shutter to go back to the shooting uh, to the live screen. And we'll see here up at the top, there's now a little icon that says BKT and the camera's put itself into a high speed burst. The next shot will bracket. So you've you kind of set yourself up now for bracketing. Now all you need to do to set that custom mode is to go menu uh come up into shooting menu number two across into custom modes press ok down to assign to custom mode press right choose the custom mode that you want press right again and when you see the word set press ok that's now locked bracketing into our custom modes so what we'll do just to double check this is i'll come out of here and i'll turn bracketing off so now the camera doesn't want to bracket at all but if i switch my dial on the top to c1 Oops, <laughs> there we go, to C1, you'll see now that the bracketing option has come up at the top, so I'm straight into bracketing. Now, of course, some cameras will allow you to set that to a button, so you can bring back a custom mode with a button press rather than with the dial. My preference is with the dial, just because I know it's a, it's a physical movement to do it. 
There we go. We managed that quite well with the overhead camera. Sometimes, sometimes this isn't set up ready, but uh, but we were lucky on that one. Um, okay, so um, hello to Deborah. Late, but you made it, so don't worry. Some of this applies to your OM1. Um, OM1 2, you're ahead of the game. I don't think anyone's even made one. Uh, so I'm not sure whether that's EM12 or OM1, but there is a mixture of information here that hopefully you'll be able to glean from that. And just because I've seen it high to mark from Gloucester in the UK. Fantastic stuff. Um, okay, so let's have a quick look looking at the time. Yeah, we'll go for another one. Linda's had to go. Bye, Linda. Take care. Got an appointment. Come and fill your boots with everything else that we, we touch on later on. Uh, fantastic stuff. Um, so David, this is an interesting question. David Delgado. Hello, David. Can you recommend possible solutions to intermittent blackout of the viewfinder? So it's an interesting question. One, this is going to depend what model of camera you have. So I need to know what camera you've got, whether or not this is a, a blackout that is meant to happen. So whether or not it's the flickering uh, blackout in terms of shooting some sequential modes, uh, or whether or not this is a fault that needs to be addressed. Uh, so definitely uh, try and give me some more information if you can before the end of the session. We've got a couple of minutes left, David, but try and give me some more information on that. If not, you can reach out to us um, uh, through our socials uh, and we'll try and get back in touch with you and see what's going on with that. Hopefully this is simply using one of the sequential modes that provides a flicker as you shoot rather than a blackout free um, solution, which is what you get on the OM1. M1X and M1 Mark II. It sounds like that these are the sequential shooting modes that do give you uh, a flicker. So what I would recommend is using the fastest possible uh, sequential modes on that one. So you're using um, silent low speed shooting That'll give you a small flicker. And if you're using high speed silent shooting, that won't give you, that'll give you virtually no flicker. Um, if that's what's going on and it's purely down to the sequential modes, then that is the way the, the cameras are designed to work. If it's something else, you definitely need to reach out to us, David. Okay. And we'll see what we can do for you. Uh, does the EM5 Mark III have panorama as the EM10 IV in camera? No, it does not. There is no panorama option in there. And there is no photo story mode either. You get the art filters, uh, but the photo story mode or panorama are not in there, David. I'm sorry to say. Uh, let's have a look at this one. So from Mark Evans. Hi, Mark. Does the preview button on the front of the Mark III operate in all modes? Uh, when you say preview button, do you mean the depth of field preview button? Because in which case, yes, I believe it does. I'm not quite sure. I'd have to check if it's uh, operating in, in movie mode. Uh, because what you should be seeing, the correct depth of field in movie mode anyway, whereas you don't in stills mode. You see the depth of field produced by whatever lens is on uh, maximum aperture. Um, ah, yes. So depth of field preview, yes, should be. Uh, should operate in all still modes, uh, M-A-S-P, yeah. Or I could have said it the normal way, which is P-A-S-M. I don't know why I said it in a completely uh, convoluted way, but hopefully that answers your question. Um, Myra, Myra Posner. Hello, Myra. Uh, no, we're still good for time, don't worry. Sometimes when I half press to focus, a little green square appears and moves around the screen, but not where I want it. How do I fix this? What is it? This sounds like the cluster AF. Um, it's probably on either an EM1, Mark II, Mark III X or an OM1. Uh, and if you want to stop that from happening, oh, I've lost my cable. Let's bring back. Oh, we've got it. There we go. There's the cable. That's what I need for this one. Uh, the cluster tracking will shuffle uh, points around within the chosen AF grid. Let's see if we can try and show this actually. So let me bring in a camera with a not very interesting scene in here. My little desk plant buddies. Uh, let's bring over this view here. Okay. So I'm going to leave Myra's comment up there just so that people know what we're talking about. So if, for example, I select a uh, fairly large group uh, of uh, AF points, okay? So I'm using uh, this lovely 25-point grid here. Now, in normal SAF mode, I halfway press, and it's just going to choose one of those points that it thinks is the best for focusing, flash green at me. Now, if I choose 
to use CAF and I halfway press, then it's going to continually autofocus as I move, but it's not going to give me a second flash. Now, what I think is going on with Myra's camera is that the AF area pointer option is set to on two. And what that will do is it will give you a clustered AF. So in the menus, if we drop down into the gear option, across into a menu and then across into AF area pointer, if that is selected to on two, and we are using a combination of uh, CAF um, plus all AF points, which I don't particularly recommend, but if you're gonna do birds in flight in the sky, it's not a bad option to use for this one. Uh, but then you're gonna get uh, this kind of option where it, it kind of moves around and it jumps about and it's looking for source shapes and things like that. It's not detecting any particular thing. It's looking for excellent uh, contrasting shapes and areas. But because we've given it the whole screen's worth of AF to work from, it'll pretty much go wherever it wants. We don't have any control over it, which is why it's great for a bird in the sky, not so great for a busy background. So Moira, uh, sorry, not Moira, Myra, if you could uh, check your A2 menu, so menu gear A2 and AF area pointer, turn that to on one, and that should solve the problem for you. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, okay, so another question just lower down here from Trevor. Um, a different topic on the OI Share app is there a way to have more than one profile to allow two cameras to have stored settings for each of them? Mark, no, not at the moment. On the OI Share app, you can only have one registered camera at a time and stored settings for that camera. You can add extra cameras for usability in terms of remote shutter or live view, but for the stored section or any camera functionality such as firmware updates on the EM1 Mark III and an OM1, uh, then you can only have one at the moment. Um, okay, lots of thanks and yeses, and looks like we were in the right place for that for some of those questions. Now, uh, oh, and I didn't lose many of you, actually, which is absolutely fantastic. So you made it through 51 minutes of me jabbering away about tech stuff as always. So I really, really appreciate that uh, as always. Thanks for coming in. I'm going to go back into the comments uh, later on, perhaps later today or tomorrow, just to check that I've got as many answers in there for you as possible. Uh, but for now, that is the end of your brand new Tech Thursday at this uh, new time uh, on a Thursday uh, as opposed to a Tuesday. So I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, ultimately come back and see some more uh, next month. Tech, uh, tech, <laughs> he said Tech Tuesday again. Tech Thursday is a monthly thing, so come back and see us. And again, uh, if you're in the UK and you're around the Norfolk or Norwich area over the next two days, come and see me. I will be in Norwich and come and have a chat uh, and talk all things camera. But for now, I'm going to stop jabbering. I'm going to leave you to the rest of your day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you all next time. Bye for now. Thank you.